Well, well thank you. Uh, and I should also say for any of you uh, from the other side of the river uh, that I also have uh, fairly significant uh, connections uh, with France, uh, though not significant enough to have ever learned the language. But I did spend uh, nine winters as a visiting professor at the Conservatoire National des Arts and Métiers in Paris and uh, loved every minute of it. But in any event, what I want to talk about today is housing policy, uh, the potential for good or ill. Actually, let me try a different set of glasses here. And uh, we're going to follow up a little bit, but it's going to be along the same lines of what you heard from Randall O'Toole this morning, or if you heard uh, uh, David Seymour's presentation in this room a couple of hours ago. Um, a similar idea. We're talking essentially about land use policy, uh, its relationship to property rights, uh, and, and frankly, uh, the economy. So let me see here. Oh, here we are. Okay. Well, first of all, um, let me tell you that I have nothing but the greatest affection for, Chuck, for, uh, for Canada. Uh, I was privileged as a kid to live here. Uh, by here, I mean Vancouver Island, Courtney. Uh, my father was a preacher and uh, lived uh, in Canada from about the age of three to about the age of six. Done a lot of work here. Um, and, and I really I do think an awful lot of Canada. And what we heard from Mr. Day just a few minutes ago was right on. I mean, the extent to which Canada has exerted leadership internationally in the international sphere is unbelievable. As I like to tell Peter Hawley, who is the uh, executive director of the Frontier Institute, Canada has become the economic leader of the first world. And, and that's not a very good commentary with all due respect on my country. Uh, I also served uh, three terms on the Los Angeles County Transportation Commission, which was overall the transit and highways in Los Angeles. Uh, I'm very much involved in Canada. The province in, um, uh, in Vancouver carried an article two days ago uh, with a little back and forth between me and Mike Harcourt, who used to be the premier of BC and who's responsible for much of the dreadful planning situation in Vancouver. Uh, and I also, uh, as I mentioned in an earlier session today, was um, hired by the city of Toronto in 1996 to try to stop, help them stop the Mike Harris consolidation of the city of Toronto. Uh, we failed, and most everybody believes uh, that it's a shame that we failed at this point. I was in a debate with Adam uh, Giambroni, who was on the city council of uh, Toronto, uh, on TTC issues a, few, a couple of years ago. And the one thing we agreed upon was that the mega city was a disaster. And if you heard David Seymour a couple of hours ago, David was pointing out the importance of interjurisdictional competition. And if there's a case study for what's gone wrong on that, uh, the city of Toronto is it. Now, I'm going to be talking about a general approach to public policy that comes out of a paper uh, that I wrote for the Frontier Institute earlier this year. We call it a time for a paradigm shift. And the basic point is this. The whole thrust of urban planning is absolutely wrong. It doesn't matter what the city looks like. What matters is how well the people live. And policy has been hijacked throughout the Western world on this issue. And it's time we turn around, in my view. We need, I think, first of all, to recognize that the economy is not something we can take for granted. I go around the world. I love to take pictures of slums largely because People in the West, especially in the, in the high-income West, don't understand what it's like. This is a dreadful slum along the riverbank in, uh, in Manila. Uh, we need to recognize, in fact, that economics, the history of economics is the history of poverty. Here is a slum you see as you land at the airport in, uh, in Mumbai. Uh, the slum, one of the reasons Mumbai is getting ready to build a new airport is because of the encroachment of the slums on the runways in, uh, in Mumbai. And I'm serious. And by the way, uh, and, and again, I won't go much into this because Mr. Day did such a nice job of it a bit ago, but it's important to recognize the role of, pro of property rights and the rule of law in a society. You cannot have productivity, I'm sorry, you can't have significant prosperity without uh, property rights and the basic point that I want to make today is that Canada stands at great risk. You stand at greater risk than we do in the United States because the spread of urban containment, comma, smart growth, you name what you want to call it, policy, is so strong at this point, you could lose the entire nation to a housing situation where your house prices are double to triple their present levels. It's already happened in Australia. 
In the U.S., it's not quite happening as fast, but we're similarly, uh, uh, we're similarly concerned. And so I want to talk about those consequences. But step back and think about what's happened to the economy. And I think it's so important because, unfortunately, the urban planning community doesn't understand the first thing about economics. The fact is that it matters what your economic policies are. This chart shows you the rise in GDP per capita uh, from 1900 to about 2010. Uh, you see Canada there leading the pack. Uh, Japan following a little bit below, the EU sort of in between, actually that's Germany, not the EU, but notice Ar Argentina. You go back to the mid-30s and Argentina by whatever, you know, by various lists will rank from 3rd to 10th in terms of its GDP per capita in the world. And look at it today and it's only going to get worse, we're probably looking at another default before too long. What's the difference? It has to do with policies. You can't have policies that destroy property rights that do not uh, 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 favor rule of law. So you have a problem. One of the big, you know, you think about it, and Randall talked about this, you think about the bust that occurred, the, the Great Recession. Well, the biggest problem we faced is the fact that the United States, the United States fiscal policy was run by a bunch of cartoon characters. I'm serious about that, which is why you've got Mickey Mouse. At the same time, in Canada, you actually have a reserve bank that's populated by adults. I'm serious about that, too. The, the, every year we have a study out of Harvard University that ranks the banks in the world. It is unusual for you not to be number one. In one of the more recent years, we were number 41 following Indonesia. It matters, and your incredible uh, a management of the Canadian economy with the Bank of Canada and the leadership that Mark Carney had, uh, g gave you and others, has been incredible. But you have another problem, and Pierre Elliott Trudeau said it best probably many years ago when he pointed out that living next to the United States is like sleeping with an elephant. No matter how well you do, much of what's going on in Canada is, de is, is decided or is, is overly influenced by what goes on uh, south of the border. So that is a problem you've got to live with and my own view and, and I was so pleased to see the bipartisan uh, comment a few minutes ago by Mr. Day pointing out the great uh, the, the, the great accomplishment of Paul Martin and the Liberals uh, in the federal parliament in balancing your budget and greatly reducing your debt uh, more than a decade ago. Now the whole reason that a lot of people in the planning uh, business are interested in urban containment policy. Urban containment policy essentially draws lines around cities, basically wants to force us all into transit and into much higher densities. One of the big things that they're concerned about is urban sprawl. This is Los Angeles. Everybody thinks of Los Angeles as being such a sprawling place. Yet, I want to make sure you know, there are two, the two most densely populated urban centers in North America are called Toronto, Los Angeles. Nothing else is close to it. Yet, of course, you know, it's an amazing thing. When you, when you have 12 million people, you know, you just get a little bit of sprawl. And there was a discussion also, I think David talked about this. Well, what is sprawl? It is the most ill-defined term in the world. Do you know that DACA, and I do a, I do a public question called International Urban, World Urban Areas, where we, where we basically attempt to estimate the population and population density of all urban areas in the world of more than 500,000 people. The most dense urban area in the world is called Dhaka. It's the capital of Bangladesh. It has about 45,000 people per square kilometer. Now, Toronto, for example, is about a little bit less than 3,000. So 45 and 3, there's a big difference. I've heard Dhaka referred to as sprawling. I've heard Hong Kong referred to as sprawling. Sprawling is whatever happens to, it, to, 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 to strike you, and we have to be very careful with those kinds of terms. There's this view that says sprawl happens in North America and nowhere else. American planners used to tell me sprawl is an American uh, phenomenon. This is Addis Ababa. Addis Ababa is in sub-Saharan uh, sub Af Africa. The GDP per capita of Ethiopia, its country, the cap country that it is the capital of, is about $1,000 per capita. This is Addis Ababa. The red is Addis Ababa in 1972. The yellow is 2010. 
And while the population has increased, it has increased nothing like the expansion of the urban area. You can go to any urban area in the world you want, and you will find the same thing. In fact, uh, giving away my you know, religious upbringing, I like to suggest that urban sprawl started when Cain and his wife decided to build next door instead of on top of Adam and Eve's house. <laughs> Now, as cities, and this is another thing planners don't understand. And, 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 I, and for example, Randall mentioned this morning Ed Glazer. Ed Glazer, an economist at Harvard, uh, has written a book called The Triumph of Cities. And if you read it, you get the impression that big cities are getting denser. Not a chance. I've done a series of, of, of research uh, that's been published in the New Geography of all the mega cities in the world, all of which I've been to except two. And the fact is, every one of them are becoming less dense, not more dense, because they are spreading out faster than they are increasing in population. So here you see on this chart, Paris starting out very dense in the 1650s, London almost as dense. They're all converging to Los Angeles densities. And granted, Paris is still about a little less than one and a half times as dense as Los Angeles or Toronto, but it's not that big a deal. And, the, and when what makes the difference is the much lower suburban densities. You can go to Jakarta, for example, which is the second largest urban area in the world. That's a big secret because a lot of the, uh, a lot of the uh, people that try to estimate these things never looked at maps to see what the spread of urbanization is in. You see that over the last 10 years, more than half of the growth in the outer suburbs, the old inner core, something like 20% uh, of the growth. This is a marvelous picture of, of, of what, I, what is my favorite rail terminal in the world, the old Victoria Rail Terminal in Mumbai. And you can see from this, Mumbai, the core of Mumbai being the blue, and the various inner suburban, outer suburban, and exurban areas. And you see, again, the spread of population and the lowering of densities. Now, one of the problems in Canada in terms of this kind of analysis is a lot of your cities like Toronto, Calgary, Edmonton uh, have expanded significantly through annexation or through um, uh, consolidation. And if you were to basically say, well, you know, okay, uh, let's, let's look at the central city in the Toronto area versus the suburbs. If you're looking at the, uh, the boundaries of the current city of Toronto, you're getting a place that's probably 75% suburban, not core city. So when the census came out in 2010 or 2011, uh, I took a look at the, federal, the, the core federal electoral districts which pretty well conform uh, to the old city boundaries before the, uh, before the mergers. And only 7% of the population increase in the six largest metropolitan areas occurred in the urban core. And by the, top, by the way, any time I mention Ottawa, I mean Ottawa Gatineau, including the Quebec part of it. Uh, there's just new research uh, that has come out within the last week out of uh, Queen's University in Kingston that says the number is more like 5%. They used a more fine-grained analysis, and it's really pretty good analysis. Now, again, there is a tendency on the part of urban planners to say all sorts of things about the great uh, uh, things that occur from higher densities. And in fact, uh, groundbreaking research at the Santa Fe Institute in, in, in New Mexico uh, was misread by them about a year ago to basically suggest, as bi as, because they, they basically said, as cities get bigger, they get more productive, no question about that. And the urban planners, of course, assumed that had to do with density. So I went into the data and found, in fact, they specifically reject that thesis. And again, density and densification are not the issues. So let's look at urban containment policy. Again, uh, we can call it smart growth, growth management, uh, compact cities, etc. This is one of my favorite pictures of the density of, of, um, of Athens, though, mind you, that's not as dense as a lot of places in the world. Uh, your big problems. Uh, the big issues really are drawing lines around cities, which we can call the Green Belt in Toronto, the urban growth boundary in Portland, uh, the agricultural preserve uh, of Montreal or Vancouver. And the problem with that is the same problem that occurs uh, when OPEC decides it's going to reduce its quotas for oil production. Fortunately, you people in Alberta and our friends in North Dakota are solving that problem, but the fact is, all things being equal, if you put limits on production in a market where there is demand, you will drive up prices and all you have to do is look at Vancouver and Toronto to see that. Now, one of the reasons that the, the urban planners want to stop the expansion of urban areas is this great fear that we're going to run out of productive capacity with respect to agriculture. Unfortunately, like with respect to so much that they talk about, they've never looked at the data. 
Let's look at Canada, for example. Let's look at the comparison of the maximum expanse of agricultural land in this nation versus what it is today. It is equal to, sorry, it is equal to the land area of the Maritimes. In other words, you've taken that much land out of production. Why? Because you were more productive than you were before. So that if you look at the land area, and I guess, I'm sorry, you can't read that. I can't either see you. Okay, <laughs> this, this last little bar is all urbanization that has occurred since Champlain founded the Ville de, de, de Quebec. Okay? All urbanization, that's the land area. Now you look at that and compare it to the difference between the maximum agricultural land and the 2011 urban uh, uh, agricultural land. Agricultural land is not a problem. Okay? Now another thing, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but another thing that we're told is we've all got to get out of our cars because of the pollution and all, and the greenhouse gas emissions and into transit. Well, you know, this is my favorite pic picture, one of the few that I didn't take. Uh, this is the Don Wallet Valley Parkway in Toronto and a GO Transit train running on top of it. Now one might ask, why are all those people not on the train? There's a very simple answer, it's not going with it. And that's the basic problem with transit. It does a great job of getting you to downtown. It can take you nowhere else. Uh, here you see a map of Vancouver with the, the distri distribution of, uh, of jobs. You see a huge, a huge concentration of jobs uh, down in the Burrard Peninsula. Not much concentration even out in, in Surrey and New Westminster. Uh, where there have been attempts to increase the employment. The problem is with transit, you can only effectively serve high density employment centers. And by the way, in case any of you are wondering, the largest employment center in Canada is called Pearson International Airport. Not downtown, not downtown Montreal. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the downtown areas across the country, on average, 15% of the employment is downtown. And if you go to Montreal, for example, and unfortunately I've not been able to get the data, but if you look at around uh, uh, Trudeau Airport in Montreal, you'll see the same kind of land use that you see around Pearson. Huge warehouses and everything. I have no idea how many people work there, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's more people than work in downtown Montreal. Now, there's also a myth that runs around that says, well, if we can just make things more dense, people will ride transit and get out of their cars. Well, Statistics Canada did a report a few years ago where they basically looked at housing that was beyond uh, 10 kilometers from downtown and found that the travel pattern of people in housing that far from downtown was the same whether they happened to live like this or in detached housing next door. In other words, the whole transit density thing is not about density, uh, it is about proximity to downtown. Now this is work from Ewing, uh, Reed Ewing and uh, Bob Severo, uh, noted urban containment uh, proponents in the United States. Uh, the Green Line, they basically have done some research and said, well, let's, let's look at what happens when you increase density. Now there are all sorts of problems with the study, and this isn't really what happens when you do increase density, they just compare different areas. Okay, you go up 10% in density, you go up 9.6% in vehicle kilometers traveled. So again, very, very little effect. And by the way, one of the big problems with urban containment policy is it concentrates everything. That means there's more traffic congestion. And according to, there, there are two reporters of international traffic congestion at the metropolitan area level. Uh, Tom Tom, which is one, ranks Vancouver behind only Los Angeles in traffic congestion in North America. And that's pretty amazing since Vancouver is something like the 25th largest metropolitan area in North America. Uh, beyond that, for a long time, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities has tried to suggest that if only we can get people out of cars and into transit, we will reduce work trip travel times and make our cities more productive. They've been saying this all along. They don't say it as much now as they used to since we published a paper a year ago taking that on directly. Uh, and basically showing in the new National Household Survey data that's just come out in the last few days reaffirms all this again, that basically transit takes about twice as long to get wherever you want it to go as, as cars. And uh, that's not surprising because, for example, in Paris, in the suburban areas with <clears throat> what we call regional metro system, the RER service, uh, if you look at the number of jobs in the Ile-de-France, that can be reached by car in an hour, it's 80%, by train, it's 40%.
So again, this is not a minor problem. This happens anywhere you want to go in the world. And the only cities, a lot of people don't realize this, the only major cities in the high income world that have more uh, transit ridership uh, in terms of passenger kilometers than, than uh, cars is, are, are Tokyo, Osaka, and uh, Hong Kong. Now these are all places that are much different than anything in Canada. And beyond that, their work trip travel times are all 40 minutes or more, not even Toronto, which ranks very poorly at 33 minutes, is as bad as these places. So you pay a real price, and the important thing is to understand this is a price in productivity and economic growth. There's good international research from both proponents of, of limiting urban um, uh, containment policy and proponents of urban containment policy that basically say that economic growth is stronger generally where, uh, uh, where there's an ability to get to more jobs in a particular period of time, especially 30 minutes is what a lot of people have in mind. Now let's talk a little bit about greenhouse gas emissions because one of the big justifications from the urban planning side for urban containment policy is greenhouse gas emissions and the great concern about the pollution of the car and, and what it does. Well, first of all, the, whole, the world, not surprising, has again left the planners behind. Now, if we were talking about 2008, all of the projections were showing that greenhouse gas emissions would continue to go like this from cars. Not anymore. These are the latest projections from the U.S. Department of Energy and the uh, Canadian urban, uh, the, the Canadian um, uh, fuel economy standards are now under review and will probably follow the U.S. as they have in the past. Uh, just like the European and Chinese standards, and you're going to see a trend like that so that we're looking at in the next, tw well, to 2030, 2035, uh, we're looking at <clears throat> an increase in driving of more than 30% and a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from cars of 30%. That's very impressive. Um, and th th this, this data from um, uh, Transport Canada says it well. A lot of people don't realize this, but you know, uh, when you slow down traffic, it becomes let more erratic. And when that happens, you create more greenhouse gas emissions because one liter of gasoline produces exactly the same amount of greenhouse gas emissions at whatever speed or however, you know, a, you, you get the same thing. And so you see here on freeways, <clears throat> In congested conditions for, per, uh, per kilometer, you're uh, getting much more greenhouse gas emissions than in free flow. Uh, same thing with respect to arterials or surface streets. The basic point is if you want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, you better get the traffic moving. And I realize a lot of urban planners don't think that way, but it's important. Now, I've not seen any good Canadian, uh, any Canadian studies on this, but there are a few studies in the United States of the potential for reducing greenhouse gas emissions from urban containment, and the data is paltry. I mean, uh, there are a few studies that go say, oh, well, you know, by 2050, we can save 9%. Now, by the way, that's in a situation where, the, where this has happened over the 50 years. Well, it, it, oh, the fact is that the studies that talk about that are roundly uh, discounting even within their own reports. I, I basically looked at all of them, and I think it's fair to say that you might be able to expect about a 3% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from all the urban containment policies if you adopt them all the way across the country. Now, by the way, that's with greenhouse gas emissions, by some accounts, going up 70% before the reduction of 3%. Now, according to the U.S. Department of Energy uh, uh, calculation of projections, there will be a 38% a reduction by 2030, and that's the latest data I can get because of, of, of how far they went, a 38% reduction from if we do nothing. So that's the difference. So not only is the greenhouse gas emissions, and I'll show you this, uh, uh, from urban containment policies expensive, it's not even very effective. And here's the big deal that no urban planner wants to talk about. I have not seen a single regional plan in any city in the first world that basically says, okay, we're going to do this, and it's going to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions by this. Okay, we're so far okay. <clears throat> and it's going to cost us so much per ton. Well, you know, that's the only thing that counts. Because if we spend more per ton to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we destroy jobs and increase poverty, and that's not what any government wants to have. The Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change of the United Nations says 
we should be able to achieve whatever reasonable goals we have with respect to greenhouse gas emission reductions at $20 to 50 per ton. Now, the best estimates that I have seen, and I'm sure they're very conservative, <clears throat> suggest that transit improvements would be about $1,000 a ton. However, nobody, except me, has ever looked at what are the uh, costs of the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from forcing people into apartments and not building single detached houses anymore. Oh, I'm sorry, another, another, another. Uh, well, I don't know, Randall, what your figure is, but my figure is $20,000. Okay. Mine's $10,000 and Oh, you, you, your, yours is $10,000 a ton? Okay, well, it's either. It's on moving cooler. Ah, uh, okay, and I use, uh, yeah, okay, the, the basic point is, I think we can agree that both $10,000 and $20,000 are more than 50. So, so yeah, and this is all very difficult. I mean, the point is, it's not even close. And, and that's a big deal. So let's talk now about housing affordability. I had the pleasure of being in Charlottetown, the, um, the weekend of the worst blizzard since the 40s. Um, but anyway, it was a great thing. First of all, housing is the largest uh, element by far of the Canadian household budget. Now, in, in addition, you know, if you go to Vancouver, you're going to hear people say to you, well, you know, people want, uh, want, want condominiums, not detached housing. That's, you look at what they're buying. I mean, look at Vancouver over here. Uh, in, uh, in, 20, in 2006, under 40% of the houses were detached, uh, yet only about 16% of the new houses added in the last five years were detached. Uh, but one has to step back and recognize that uh, Vancouver doesn't permit you to build detached housing. The interesting thing to me is despite the awful urban planning policies, uh, in all of the metropolitan areas besides, major metropolitan areas besides Vancouver, uh, you had either approximately the same number, the, the same share of new housing and detached housing or more. And look at Toronto, it's amazing because Toronto has uh, <clears throat> had a long history of condominiums, apartments, and detached house, semi-detached housing. So don't think for a moment that Canadians are voting against um, detached housing. This is a chart from a Reserve Bank of Australia publication. The only point of it is to show you that historically, if you go back as late as the 19, early 1990s, uh, we, uh, we, we publish a report called the Demographia International Housing Affordability Survey. It deals with almost 350 markets in the US, Canada, Ireland, UK, New Zealand, Australia, and Hong Kong. Um, you'll find, except for the Hong Kong market, uh, that the median house price divided by the median household income tended to be three or less. Uh, and that's changed very much. You can see what's happened here. All of the countries were there. Australia has gone up very much. Canada has been rising as well. Uh, that's the report that I, um, that I told you about. Uh, we call the, me the, multiple, the, um, the, the measure of the median multiple. Here's what's happened in Australia. Now, housing in Sydney uh, it was already more expensive in 1981 because about the same time that Vancouver was, was beginning uh, uh, it, its uh, strong regulation, Sydney was as well, but you can see back in 1981, uh, all of the major metropolitan areas except for, uh, for uh, Sydney were at about three. And you can see now housing affordability has been absolutely destroyed in Australia. And by the way, if you go into the outback to places like Bathurst or Toowoomba, you will find housing affordability is worse than Calgary. And that's saying something. Um, cost of houses relative to incomes in the Canadian, major Canadian cities. You see Montreal from 2004 to 2012 uh, gone up hugely. Uh, you see Ottawa up a bit. Uh, Ottawa just hasn't got much into the Mike Harris, uh, Dalton McGinney uh, land use uh, regulations yet. I see evidence they will. You see Toronto is up substantially with the Green Belt, Calgary with the Planet uh, program, uh, Edmonton not so bad, and Vancouver of course with the uh, really awful land use programs. And, and by the way, Montreal is clearly a result of the failure of the Liberal government, unfortunately, to do a sufficient review of the agricultural reserve. Now, Anthony Downs, who's an economist at the Brookings Institute, talks about the importance of competitive land supply. This is from the west side of Portland, about six miles from where I grew up. And uh, what you see, based upon some 2011 uh, tax assessment uh, uh, analysis I did, uh, inside the urban growth boundary, that is to say on the south side of West Union Road, 
one road, 180,000 per acre for raw land, 16,000 on the north side where, where development is not a, per, a permitted. Arthur Grimes, who is the chairman of the board of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, found almost the same relationship in Auckland. Uh, and of course, uh, Kate Barker in the UK found even worse uh, examples than that. And here she is, she did a report for the, for the government uh, of the UK under Tony Blair, basically saying the housing affordability problems in the UK are definitely a problem that has been caused by urban containment policy. Uh, Mr. Bowles, who is the uh, Minister of Planning in the current government, has said that, that the uh, housing affordability is the most important uh, social justice problem uh, that the US, uh, or that the UK has. And I, I want to point out that if you go to the websites, read some stuff out of BC, read some stuff out of the University of Calgary, you'll see these planners who are basically saying, well, there is the possibility that it can increase housing prices, but there's no consensus. <laughs> well, these, seriously, these people haven't even looked at the literature. You cannot find a respectable uh, 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 a bit of economic result of uh, uh, research that does not find this relationship, except those various pieces of research that have been created by planners. Some of them economists, but, but again, the idea that there's no consensus is crazy. Don Brash uh, was the uh, Reserve Bank Governor in New Zealand for about 14 years ago, and in fact, uh, 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 well, in any event, uh, so anyway, he basically did, our, did a, uh, an introduction for us to the a housing affordability survey basically saying if you find prices out of line, uh, you can bet that it is going to be urban containment policy. Bill English, the Deputy Prime Minister of New Zealand, wrote our introduction this last year. They have just introduced, I'm sorry, they've just passed within the last two weeks legislation to begin dismantling the urban containment policies that have created such a mess in New Zealand. Now, that's going to take a while to fix, but at least important first steps have been made. Uh, we just published this information research a couple of days ago uh, because the planners have been saying for years, well, you know, yeah, the urban growth boundary in Portland may increase housing prices, but they will be offset by reductions in the, uh, in, in the uh, area by, by allowing greater densification. So what we did is we went back and said, well, let's see what actually happened in the areas uh, where there's more density and where there's more poverty. And in fact, the house price increases and rent price increases have been far greater in poorer areas than they have been in the rest of the community at the same time that overall costs of housing uh, have gone up in the Portland area. And, and the interesting thing is if you go back, and I've described this in a new geography article, if you go back and look at, at how the researchers uh, 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 make these points in data that's now 15 years old, mind you, uh, they never actually say that there is such an, in, uh, such a, an effect. They say it should be. Uh, and should is enough to get you no consensus in the urban com planning community. So let's talk about the consequences and the challenge. First of all, this is no small deal. Okay, we have research all over the place that says urban containment policies interfere substantially with economic growth. Uh, we, see reduced we see reduced employment in the Randstad area, higher commercial development costs which have been uh, uh, raised by people in the UK concerned about uh, growth there, Raven Sachs of the US Federal Reserve, and some research that says that part of the higher unemployment rates that have occurred in the UK are the respo uh, in response to this. Paul Cheshire, who is an economist at the London School of Economics, says that urban containment is incompatible with housing affordability. And then we have uh, uh, Edwin Mills and an associate, Mills being one of the famous long-term uh, urban uh, uh, economists in the world, has reaffirmed what others, including me and Randall, have said before, and that is, it is difficult to imagine another plausible cause of the 2008-2009 financial crisis than the bubble that occurred in places like California and Florida and so on. In other words, urban containment policy, and he goes on to say, in the absence of excessive control, housing construction would qu quickly deflate a, speculating, uh, a speculative housing bubble. Now, you have some problems in Canada. More than anywhere except perhaps South Korea and Japan, you have a concentration of population in one population center 
that makes it incredibly important. You think about the Golden Horseshoe, about a quarter of your possible population is there. That area is in the process of seeing its housing affordability absolutely decimated. That could impact the economy, and by the way, the new data out from the NHS says that median, house, or median um, household incomes actually grew less in Ontario than in any political division of the country. No other, no other province did as poorly, and of course the territories all uh, did better. Uh, and so that gets us back to Canada's great banking system. Some of you probably remember that last fall, uh, five of your six national, large national banks uh, were downgraded. And why were they downgraded? Because of concerns from people like the Bank of Canada and others about the level of household debt which was being driven by increased housing prices. And let me tell you, if the urban containment policies that are now being implemented in places like Calgary and Saskatoon and Regina and Ottawa and Toronto and Montreal have the same kind of effect that they've had elsewhere in the world, the Bank of Canada has just begun to see the problems. And with all due respect, as good as it is, there aren't any monetary policies in its arsenal that can, that can trump or, or neutralize uh, the increases in prices that those kinds of policies are going to have as a result of provincial and regional policy. There are other problems. Uh, you know that mortgage rates are very low now. They're likely to go up. That's going to make housing affordability even worse. You have also a big student debt situation. So that means the kids that are coming out of school now are going to have even less money to pay for houses in a situation where it costs more. You have a situation where more than half of the growth of this nation is from immigration. Yet recent reports are telling us that uh, today's immigrants are making much less than immigrants 20 or 30 years ago. In the long run, this has got to pay. Finally, you, like other Western nations, have a very serious fertility problem. You have a rich welfare state. Uh, it's got to be paid for by someone, somebody, yet you are not at replacement fertility rate. And if you think you're not at replacement fertility rate, go to Vancouver, where the fertility rate within the city of Vancouver is competitive with Shanghai and with Seoul and with Singapore. So this is going to be very, a very difficult problem uh, to solve. And it comes down to a basic issue. And this is a paper I did for a European Socialist Journal last year upon request. It was a lot of fun. Um, and, and that is, the issue is not urban planning. The issue is people. If we were talking about education policy, you would think me a fool if I were to say, well, you know, what's really important is the buildings. But that's what these guys are saying. People are more important than urban form or how people uh, uh, travel. So it is a more competitive world. It is going to become far more and more difficult for first world nations, including Canada. And it really is an important thing, I think, to try to get urban policy under control. You may never get Vancouver back to three instead of nine five, where it is now in terms of its median multiple. But at least maybe you can keep the median multiple from going to five in Saskatoon and five in Calgary and five in Edmonton and so on. So anyway, thank you very much. I'm happy to try to answer your questions.